how do you measure success when you're talking about preventive medicine? Lockdown, which by the way has existed since the Middle Ages, you could say is the nuclear option when it comes to preventive medicine, is always that choice. How many lives did lockdown save? How many livelihoods did it ruin? Hello, everyone. I'm Francois Picard. Welcome to the France 24 debate. Yeah, we're looking at the Sunday Times reporting that uh, nine days of what it calls dithering back in March cost the UK dearly with a new study from London's Imperial College claiming that one week sooner in, in lockdown could have saved 20,000 lives in Britain. That is half of the death toll there from COVID-19. But it's a world of competing narratives as we've seen since the month of March. Some contest the science, some swear by it. And now, well, summer is here. What to do on both sides of the English Channel? About the rest of the school year? Social distancing for travelers? And what about the rest of the world? Brazil and India, for instance, easing lockdown as infection rates there continue to soar. Donald Trump reducing the number of high-level meetings devoted to coronavirus. He has scheduled a return to campaign rallies next week. And this as the death toll soars in the U.S., more broadly, there's science, there's economics, and there's also politics. And if there is a second wave of infections in September, what would be the chances of a second lockdown? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at lockdown politics. And uh, joining us from Newcastle, Dr. Stergios Moskos, Associate Professor at the Department of uh, Applied Sciences at Northumbria University. Welcome back to the show. Nice to see you again. We want to welcome uh, from Oslo, Norway, Sonny Kapoor, Managing Director of the think tank Redefine. Good to see you. Hi. Same here. All right. From uh, uh, Nottingham in uh, England, David Payton, Professor of Industrial Economics at Nottingham University Business School. Welcome to the show. Pleasure to be with you. And is there a philosopher in the house from Warwick, uh, the chair of the philosophy department at the University of Warwick, uh, is Fabienne Peter, your upcoming new book, The Grounds of Political Legitimacy. That's, a, that's an important word for this discussion, legitimacy. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. The hashtag is F24debate. Yeah, uh, when's the right time to uh, deconfine, as the French call it, to ease lockdown? Um, 20,000 lives uh, could have been saved a week earlier that's uh, what uh, the uh, former uh, government advisor on the scientific uh, advis advisory group for emergencies, Niall Ferguson, told a parliamentary uh, panel earlier this week. It's um, nine days that mattered, he says. The epidemic was um, doubling every three to four days before lockdown interventions were introduced. So had we introduced uh, lockdown measures a week earlier, we would have reduced the death, our final death toll by at least a half. Um, so whilst I think the measures, given what we know about this, knew about this virus then in terms of its transmission and its lethality, were warranted, I wouldn't uh, second guess them at this point. Certainly, had we introduced them earlier, we would have seen many fewer deaths. So one week made all the difference. Uh, you agree with that, Stergios Moskos? Yes, certainly. And there were a lot of us in the scientific community with previous experience of uh, virology outbreaks, things like Ebola, Zika, who were clamoring, literally clamoring from the rooftops, as we say it, for lockdown to start as soon as possible in Britain. And the principal reason for that is that we could see very clearly that people were not taking the condition seriously. Uh, the government wasn't prepared to put measures similar to those of South Korea so that we won't need the lockdown. And we were basically hurtling into this situation. We had um, horse racing continue with massive gatherings. We had the football matches that introduced cases from Spain as we were worried was going to happen. Now this is proven. Uh, we had all sorts of events and skiing holidays from Italy that resulted in seeding of multiple, multiple uh, cases in the UK. So yes, Neil, Neil is correct. And I think Neil's temperament and approach uh, in being quite uh, 
calm and how he conveys information probably did not help in a alpha male setting of trying to decide what exactly needs to happen and how but that's you know that's for the psychologists to discuss as a scientist we're very clear that we needed to do something very quickly and i think you'll find that there are a lot of us now uh, who are still very clear that we must not uh, initiate uh, the, conf the confinement or an unlock uh, that that would be a, a very serious mistake from a uh, lives and uh, welfare and years of uh, life lost, whichever measure you put to it, basically, with regards to healthcare. Now, there's still a debate over how bad it's really been. Um, I noticed, David Payton, on your Twitter feed, you pointed to an article by David, uh, by, um, um, uh, that was in The Spectator, which pointed to a study done by a statistician at the University of Bristol by the name of uh, uh, Simon uh, Wood. Now, the Devil is perhaps in the detail here. The graph that he's talking about is the number of fatalities, new infections that resulted in fatalities. And he's claiming in that study that it peaked before the lockdown. Does that mean that uh, lockdown was unnecessary? What are your thoughts on that? Well, we know that the peak of deaths in the UK was on the 8th of April. Um, if you work back to when uh, that implies that infections peaked and started to fall, I think it's pretty clear that was before the 23rd of March, which was when lockdown happened. And you can um, be sure of that both from when deaths happened, but also if you look at things like uh, telephone calls to our um, medical services, uh, when, when they peaked, given that infections take a few days to, to appear, it's pretty clear that the absolute um, latest that the peak of infections happened was perhaps 18th, 19th, maybe 20th of March, a few days before full lockdown. So I think in terms of the full lockdown that happened on the 23rd of March, we can be pretty sure that that wasn't necessary for infections to reduce. Whether it led to um, faster reductions in infections is a, is a different matter. And that doesn't mean, of course, that other measures... Do you, agree, do you agree with Dr. Moscos that the lockdown should have happened a week sooner? Um, it, it depends what you mean by lockdown. In terms of the actual lockdown and uh, schools shutting and people being confined to their houses, I don't think there's any evidence of that uh, in, in favour of that. Um, if you look at countries across Europe, there's all sorts of different experiences and lockdown can mean different things in terms of, of policy. And I think it'll be a long time before we really clear which measures were more effective in reducing infections than others. But of course, we also have to think about the, the consequences of the, of the lockdown measures. And that, that's important, both in terms of not just the economic consequences, but also in terms of health consequences of other um, health measures that people don't take advantage of, getting cancer tests and screening and so on. Stergis Moskos? So there's several points that are raised here. Uh, I'll, I'll try and address every one of them. I'll start with the last one. Yes, you are correct. If we have lack of access to healthcare services, then we have other conditions that are affected, as we all have uh, observed. Uh, so the question you need to ask then is how do we reduce the impact to the healthcare system? And the data coming from Asia at that time was evidently clear that the, the major impact was going to be on the healthcare system. So from that perspective, whatever measure you can take to reduce that impact is important. Did we know how much uh, transmission occurred by airborne, by fomite, by every different type mode of transmission at the time? No. Do we do know that now? We have a much better idea. So let's not put hindsight into this. Let's think about how the situation was back then. We knew it was a respiratory transmitted virus. And therefore, we knew that it was very likely that people in close contact or contact of some sort or another would be at an increased risk. So from that perspective, reducing contact between individuals, kids, which clearly did not die, but did disease from the, did suffer the disease uh, and have been shown to transmit the disease now, uh, would be a big risk. So there were a lot of aspects in society that were very important. Now, I remember very clearly, I pulled out my uh, research team from my lab two weeks before the government issued its edict, if you like, about lockdown. I remember very clearly my university doing things about this in preparation ahead of it. I remember very clearly people calling us and saying, you have an open day. It, we don't feel safe. Coronavirus is, you know, flaring up. What should we do? Uh, we don't want to turn up. And, you know, that, for somebody like me, you were in a, in a rock and a hard place. But I had a diabetic and I had a, uh, and I still have a, thank goodness, 
uh, a leukemic uh, student in my research team, and I was in no way prepared to put them at risk. And this is the crux of it. We have a disease that actually can transmit like wildfire. It has transmitted like wildfire. And you can sit and watch, or you can pour some water on it. And the measures necessary to stop transmission would be the same to stop the transmission internationally, to stop the transmission nationally, to stymie the damage to the healthcare system, stymie the damage to the economy. And the numbers of what has happened worldwide based on the different versions of lockdown that have been followed speak for themselves. South Korea did not put a lockdown, but they put contact tracing and they put testing in place on an unprecedented scale and they managed it. We didn't do it. In fact, we turned around and said, actually, you know what? It's going to be out of hand. So let's just put our hands up in the air and say, we can't do any more contact tracing. Was that the correct approach? All right, let me, let me bring in on this uh, Fabienne Peter, uh, because the man we heard earlier, uh, Niall Ferguson, uh, he is a respected epidemiologist, uh, but he had to resign his post as a government advisor because he was caught uh, breaking uh, lockdown to uh, uh, be with his mistress. Uh, he, be, he went from being Professor Lockdown to Professor Pants Down in the British tabloids. And it brings us to that question of, you know, we're discovering just how much this whole science is political and legitimacy. And who do you believe? Well, I think COVID-19 presented us with a really interesting situation because I completely agree with you. Normally, politics is really messy. We might have partial expertise on some uh, public health effects, some economic effects, etc. But we don't have expertise on the key political question, what should we do? But what was really interesting um, in early March, mid-March in the UK, it became increasingly clear that this is a situation where we do appear to have fairly robust evidence that there is a right answer to the question, what should be done? And that is, some, you know, we have to take quite drastic measures, lockdown, etc. So um, is Niall Ferguson the right man to be speaking on behalf of that? I think so. He seemed to have the right scientific credibility. What he was saying was backed up by the WHO. There seems to be an international scientific consensus. Um, so what he, the, the way in which he was advising the government seemed to have been the right thing, um, also in retrospect. And if we now look internationally, we have now again a fantastic uh, opportunity to compare how different governments have responded. And it looks like quite a few governments have responded better than the UK government. Uh, Sonny Kapoor, your thoughts on, uh, well, the whole talk of how to ease lockdown in the UK is going and uh, who people will listen to ultimately? I think this goes partly to the point you were just talking about, about who does one trust. And I think that the UK has scored a huge self-goal, own goal, in keeping Dominic Cummins in government. Uh, that single man, indirectly, history might judge, may end up being responsible for thousands of deaths through his irresponsible behavior, his entitled behavior, by breaking down all of the rules that his own government had set and do it willingly and failing to apologize about it and failing to be held to account by the prime minister. And this basically just means that the narrative, which has always been just under the surface in the UK, one rule for the elite, other rules for everybody else, that has been reinforced. And be it, you know, whether you're a young person who knows that you are personally in the low risk category, uh, or you are someone else who needs, for whatever reason, to get out and see family or work, any future rules, gradual lockdown, any second outbreak followed by a lockdown etc would become essentially unenforceable because uh, lockdowns primarily depend as do tax payments on most people 90 95 percent of the people uh, following the rules we simply do not have the resources in a democratic society to enforce rules across the board and by uh, and and dominic cummins behavior is significantly going to reduce compliance with any set of rules and that could be everything from wearing masks to contact tracing to actual lockdown.
uh, history will judge that man very, very harshly and rightly David, so. David Payton, do you agree that uh, a second lockdown is now politically impossible in the UK? Well, I certainly hope so. I hope we can find a better way of dealing with, um, you know, if there are further outbreaks. We, we just, I think we need to be a little bit careful that we don't rewrite history in terms of government policy. I'm, I'm no fan of uh, how the government has necessarily approached this. But if we go back to March, um, it was, and we look at the minutes of the uh, advisory meetings, it was Dominic Cummings, for example, who was really pushing for a lockdown. And it was a scientist on the government SAGE committee who were opposed to a lockdown a couple of weeks before. So I think the government would argue that they have, you know, followed the scientific advice um, on in terms of lockdowns. But I think we've, we've learned and a then lot. And he broke his own rules. Uh, well, he claims he, he didn't. He um you know, move to a different household for a, for a while. So I think within the letter of the law and potentially the spirit, he, he didn't. That's a little bit of a sideshow, I think. Um, yeah. If we look back, people were worried at the time where people are going to stop breaking, start breaking the lockdown. Um, you know, we've had quite a lot of evidence. We had pictures of crowded beaches and so on. And actually, you look now a few weeks later, there's absolutely no evidence that in those areas, infections have increased. If anything, they've sorry, I'll interject on there going down. Evidence that the, the numbers have increased. Here in the northeast, we have the Public Health England and the NHS say there's been an uptick. There's been an uptick in the southwest, which is Cornwall with all the beaches uh, and the photos no, that we saw, and the northwest. So I'm afraid that that data is actually in contrast. Okay, so, so just to be absolutely clear, if you look at uh, the regional data on pillar one testing, it's every single region has continued to decrease in terms of the infections over time. Of course, from day to day, there's little ups and downs. But for example, the Northwest, um, the in, in, reported infections are down um, over 30% over the past uh, week or two. There's been a very consistent decrease throughout. You look at the particular worries, Bournemouth, South End, uh, Cornwall, infections have gone down in those areas too. So we do have to be clear about what the data shows. Yes, I agree. So deaths have gone down overall, but no, no, infections in fact, have gone up. No, well, I'm sorry, but the Office of National Statistics is reporting clearly the numbers that are much higher. Overall, the damage of this situation is 120,000 people dead. It doesn't matter what they came from. It's 120,000 excess deaths in four months. As Stergios Moskos, uh, on that, uh, uh, there's, again, it's who you listen to for your news that matters. Uh, there was a column in the Daily Telegraph uh, this uh, Thursday, uh, which they quote a um, cancer specialist, an oncologist, um, who uh, is saying medics are sometimes too eager to put COVID-19 on death certificates. Your reaction to that? Yeah, he's retracted that statement. He's retracted the statement. But again, how much has politics seeped into all this? It's got nothing to do with politics. When you have a death statement, you're writing, what are you seeing if you do, let's say, um, uh, an autopsy? If you see a broken bone, COVID, and 20 tumors uh, on that person, you will uh, presume that the 20 tumors killed them. But it quite as well might have been the, you know, the broken bone going right through the heart as well. So it's a question of what is in that particular case. So if the death certificate actually reports COVID, it means that that person had COVID. Now, do we know from thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases and data of death certificates that people with pre-existing conditions are more vulnerable? Well, I'm sorry, we knew that already. It doesn't matter what disease you have. If you get an infection, you are at higher risk. So there you go. The policy led to 120,000 excess deaths. And even right. the person who was misquoted retracted that statement. David and Stergios talking about the fact that people have flocked to beaches when the weather's been nice, and it has been nice this spring. Uh, yeah, because you have lives in the mix, livelihoods, and now you've also got summer vacation. Simon Harding has that story. It's an unusual situation for European travellers. Used to free movement within the Schengen area, tourists are left scratching their heads after European countries announced different times and ways of reopening their borders. Italy was the first nation to fully reopen its doors on the 3rd of June, whereas most EU countries had already agreed on the 15th of June as the day they would open up their borders, with some notable exceptions. A more prudent Spain has decided to wait until the 1st of July. The Balearic Islands, however, will reopen to tourists on June 15th. Denmark and Austria, however, will only be allowing people in from select countries. The United Kingdom 
which is not a member of Schengen, has implemented a 14-day quarantine for anyone entering the country, an issue which has annoyed many Brits living in France. If I want to go back to England to see my family and my ageing grandmother, um, not only do I have to keep social distancing, but also I have to stay under house arrest. I call it house arrest in inverted commas for 14 days. And then when I come back to France, I have to also go back under house arrest for 14 days. Despite the recommendations of the EU, it is up to each individual state to decide whether or not to open or close their borders. Greece, whose economy relies heavily on tourism, has expressed a wish to reopen to travellers from outside the EU, including Australia, China and South Korea, adding more confusion to the situation. Sonny Kapoor, you mentioned Boris Johnson's aide, uh, Dominic Cummings, as being responsible for the... Uh, to a good to a large degree for the political pressure to not have a second lockdown. But as you saw in that report, it's not just in the UK that there's pressure. Oh, no, absolutely. And this is going to be hugely challenging across the board in Europe, uh, especially as you know everybody normally expects to be getting out for all of July or August, depending on where you are. Uh, but the Boris Johnson reference remains relevant because, you know, as, as I think someone mentioned, the international comparisons are in. And it's very clear that we in the UK have are close to the bottom of the league table in terms of how well we tackled the crisis so far. Uh, and on top of that, we mustn't forget there is the looming danger of no deal Brexit and what it is going to do to decimate the economy. So things will be especially hard politically in the UK. They will be hard everywhere. And, and if you look at a map of France, Sonny, the, the areas that are set to suffer the most going forward are the ones where there's lots of services sectors, i.e. tourism. Again, that, that, that pressure against a second lockdown, it's livelihoods that are at stake right now. They are. Uh, that having been said, some lessons have been learned. So in a number of cases, and this is not true across the board, uh, lockdowns are being eased at a time that the infection rate across the population has fallen. So that's helpful, which means any future spike, uh, we will have some warning, particularly with some of the contact tracing apps and checks that are being put on board. There is going to be some form of social distancing in place. And yes, you know, it may not be two meters, but if you're one meter away, you're not randomly kissing strangers, you are less likely to get infected. Masks may, particularly in closed spaces, will have an important role to play in reducing transmission, washing of hands. Hopefully that's a good habit that remains with us as also uh, checks at other critical places and more random testing for the population. So one hopes that with many of these checks and balances, new behaviors in place, together with at least some of the precautionary principle, right? I mean, as an example, I will think twice before ending up in any crowded bars, even if there are crowded bars in Oslo now, and so will many other people. So there will be behaviors in place that will mean that the path of a future increase in infections will look different, will have longer delays built in, will have more scope for corrective action. And hopefully that together with a greater capacity in the health system that has been built up over these past few months across most countries uh, will mean that we at least do not have to go into a total lockdown again. I may be wrong, but one hopes that enough things are in place uh, that we can avoid at least a partial, a total lockdown again in most countries. Uh, Fabienne Peter, there's the question of uh, how strong is the self-preservation instinct of humanity? I ask that because uh, we have seen a rise in activity based on cell phone data in the US, according to National Public Radio, uh, to two thirds of what it was before the pandemic. And we're seeing states that are opening up, places like Florida and Texas, despite an infection rate that is definitely still rising. So how short-sighted are we in the end? Well, I think there's lots of empirical evidence that we tend to be fairly short-sighted. 
but the experience in recent months has also shown that we can be surprisingly altruistic and cooperative in many countries wearing masks has taken off much faster than we would have expected so people seem to be moved by the thought that we need to wear masks to protect others uh, which is fascinating um, perhaps if i can add one more point to it that, that what was discussed earlier uh, in terms of this trade-off between protecting lives and protecting livelihoods, just to make things even more complicated, it seems that COVID-19 has particularly hit people who are towards the lower end of the income and wealth distribution. So the politically difficult situation is now that those who might benefit more from an ease of lockdown because they can get their jobs back or less at risk of losing their jobs might also be the ones who then from a public health point of view will bear the costs um, of increasing infection rates so i'm just uh, I'm, I'm saying this to add to the problem that even though at the beginning of the outbreak there seems to have been an unusually clear situation that an intervention was needed, right now it's much more difficult politically. We're back in sort of more normal, messy political territory. Messy political territory, perhaps nowhere so on this planet more right now than Brazil, where the rate is still soaring. And yet this week, Sao Paulo, the nation's biggest city, Reopening, Helen Gainsford has more. With Sao Paulo's shops open again, social distancing seems to have gone out of the window. Although most businesses do have hygiene measures in place to try to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Mudamos os protocolos de atendimento. Então aqui na entrada nós temos um carrinho de autocuidado onde as clientes são convidadas a higienizar suas mãos. É, temos uh, after three months in lockdown, officials in Brazil's business hub are relaxing quarantine measures. This despite the state still being heavily hit by the virus. On Wednesday, Sao Paulo reported a record of 340 deaths in 24 hours. Not everyone is convinced it's appropriate to reopen at the peak of the crisis. Acho que o comércio ainda não está preparado, as pessoas ainda não estão preparadas. A gente está começando a atingir um pico agora e eu acho que as pessoas só deveriam abrir realmente os serviços essenciais, tipo supermercado. But President Jair Bolsonaro is determined to forge ahead. Dismissing the coronavirus as a little flu, he's been consistently anti-lockdown measures, saying they're needlessly wrecking the economy. And following in Donald Trump's footsteps, has threatened to withdraw from the World Health Organization, accusing the body of spreading misinformation. Brazil is Latin America's hardest hit country by the pandemic, with official figures showing around 40,000 deaths from the virus. David Payton, we've had panelists on this show from Brazil tell us that. Uh, there's a feeling in Brazil that there's almost a, a, a class differentiation where the middle classes, shopkeepers, uh, business owners, are pressuring employees to get back to work. Uh, is that something you've noticed in the UK? I think there's a there's a mixture. It's clear that all levels, um, you know, many people's livelihoods have been devastated. The government's provided support with the furlough scheme, like like other countries, but it's people at all levels who've been hit by the lockdown. And I think one of the thing, things we're learning over the past uh, few, few weeks and months is that perhaps there are better ways of dealing with the uh, future infection break breakouts than very, um, you know, sort of one size fits all, absolutely closing down everything. So you look at countries like Germany, as they've reopened schools and shops and bars and so on. There's been no effect from those measures in terms of, of increases in infections or deaths or admissions to hospital. And that's been a similar picture across most it's European countries. It's been coupled countries. with effective contact tracing. Uh, sure. So, so that's my point. There's other other things that can be done, and you see a similar picture in, uh, you know, in Denmark, in the Netherlands, in Switzerland, uh, Austria as well. Particularly with uh, with schools, both where schools shut, we didn't see uh, that didn't seem to cause a decrease in infections. And now, when schools have opened, it hasn't caused an increase in infections. So, I think we we've got a little bit more information and confidence now that we can. Um, proceed in, in less damaging ways for people's livelihoods, for the future of children in their schools, and for also the sort of psychological 
uh, harms that are being done to people through lockdown, people on their own, grandparents who haven't been able to see their children and so on. You know, I think we can look forward to the future with a little bit more uh, optimism in terms of our ability to deal with future outbreaks, which certainly, you know, doesn't look like it will be with uh, with full lockdowns in the future. Uh, Sonny Kapoor, just, sorry to interject, uh, you may have forgotten the South Korean incident with uh, a certain nightclub that instigated another outbreak. Um, there were several hundred people that were affected from that outbreak, Dave. So I think, yes, you can say that some studies, very piecemeal, very focused on some general data in involving uh, third party monitoring, as in people who are presenting with symptoms and therefore get diagnosed, suggest that there might not be a big effect. But the evidence about what happens when there is transmission is that this can go out of hand very quickly. Where in South Korea, with the contact tracing app, with the mass testing, and they were- Are, are, we, are we, Dr. Moskos- we don't have that here yet. Dr. Moskos, are we scaremongering when we talk about the fear of a second wave? Do you think no, that by the not. fall- Do you think that by the fall, we'll uh, have effective contact tracing, we'll be able to replicate that South Korean model here in Europe? That is not my field of expertise. I'm relying on others who are, uh, you know, computer scientists and are reviewing the data and the information and the applications involved uh, to uh, make the statement around the capacity of the systems implemented here being operational or not. And there has been a lot of coverage in the media about whether or not uh, the system is operational in the UK as has been claimed. That point aside, the diagnostics capability has also been challenged significantly, and that is my area of expertise. And I can tell you hand on heart that we do not have the capacity, apart again from looking at the number of deaths, which runs two to three weeks behind the transmission rate, to assess whether or not we have a problem in this country. So we're running behind what's happening by three weeks. So before we can actually implement something, it will be a month before we can see the effect. And that's a key problem that we have right now. Will there be another outbreak? Look at Iran. They've had a, the second uh, peak already. And please also bear in mind that we had upticks as a result of these relaxation effects uh, in the UK already. Uh, I personally think that um, spring, you know, autumn is going to be far too late with regards to this risk. And there's 120 other scientists with relevant expertise who have co-signed a letter, an open letter saying raising the lockdown right now is a big, big mistake. Fabian, Peter, you heard uh, David Payton talk about the psychological harm uh, on those who've been isolated during this period. Again, it's about measuring the risk, measuring the damage, damage to lives, damage to livelihoods. As we go forward, how, where is this conversation going to go where you are in the UK and more globally? It's a very, very challenging conversation, right? The costs uh, that people bear either from the illness, losing loved ones, or then from the effects of the measures taken to contain the outbreak are massive. And they need to be taken seriously by any government. Um, and I'm hoping the UK government is taking those effects seriously and is now um, thinking hard about how to forge a, uh, a way forward. I, I agree with uh, Stereos, we're not out of the woods yet. So very difficult decisions still have to be made. Um, difficult decisions in the sense that if um, governments get them wrong, a lot of people will suffer. Sonny Kapoor, you're sitting in Oslo, uh, in Norway, which uh, has a lockdown, uh, which has been eased, uh, next door to Sweden, which uh, uh, advertised its herd immunity policy. Uh, there seems to be a bit of a backlash across the border. I know there's always a bit of a rivalry between those two nations. But sitting where you are during this entire period, what has this taught you? Well, uh, two things. Uh, one is that populists such as Bolsonaro, Trump and uh, Boris Johnson uh, have come out of the crisis very badly with blood on their hands. That's one part. The second, uh, the Swedes have historically been outliers and gone their own, own way. I mean, if you look at the experience of World War II, where they stayed neutral, and this is yet another in long line of Swedish exceptionalism. And from the outside in, it may seem that opinion within Sweden was monolithic on going down a different route, despite everybody else left, right and center taking uh, 
significantly different policy. And, and in reality, there, there has been far more debate, including criticism, which is now rising as the evidence of higher Swedish debts become completely uh, in, in, uh, impossible to refute, as well as the fact that many of the supposedly less harmful economic effects that Sweden said it was going to see uh, as the Swedish economy continues to be hit again, in some cases with, you know, almost as large uh, a hit as some of the economies that did have a lockdown. Uh, it's unclear uh, with hindsight as to whether this was a sensible decision or not. That having been said, again, it wasn't as if there were not significant behavioral changes in Sweden. So Norway, Sweden, Denmark all have high levels of social capital, high levels of trust in government. And people generally took the guidelines very seriously. I saw it firsthand in Norway, even if they were not imposed. So at no point was there police in the streets in Oslo imposing social distancing, for example. And so some of that, so one, one appropriate way of thinking about it, it wasn't a full lockdown enforced by uh, police on the street, uh, but it was some form of a half lockdown with some more targeted policies that came a bit too late, for example, to isolate uh, the elderly and the vulnerable in Sweden. So it did see a lot of deaths in care homes, as have many other countries. So it wasn't really, uh, you know, it was shades of gray. It wasn't black or white that Sweden didn't have a lockdown and Italy and the UK did. Well, it's certainly not shades of gray in your native Greece, Stergos Moskos, because if there are no tourists this summer, uh, the economy really goes down the drain. Yes. Uh, um, uh, for better or for worse, I have actually direct contact with the equivalent of SAGE uh, of Greece. I have no input. I have to be very clear, but I know a lot of them are panelists. I'm collaborating with some of them on some of the research I'm doing. And not, none of them, uh, as far as I know, are happy with what's going to happen in the next few weeks because none of them feel confident that there won't be uh, spread it's almost inevitable in their minds and a resurgent of the virus from the inbound tourists. It's a political decision. Uh, and the question then becomes, who are the expendables uh, on a national level? Now, we saw that in Sweden, the expendables became the people that were elderly. Uh, Fabienne pointed out that in the UK and in the United States, the expendables now are going to be the individuals in the low income uh, margins. In Greece, the bedrock of the economy is tourism and for better or for worse and they will be the expendables and you know i live in england for 20 years i've seen what happens in Faliraki with the british that go on holiday every year and I, I i saw in my own neighborhood what happened on the v day celebrations as the alcohol flowed the inhibitions disappeared everybody wants to go back into the pub and have a pint i totally understand it everybody wants to go and work again but we can't do that if we're dead or if we're in hospital, or if our grandparents, which we haven't seen in weeks, are put at immediate risk because our urge to go and hug somebody overwhelms our inhibitions, especially after a tipple. David Payton, the movie Jaws, uh, the local authorities tell the sheriff to play down this shark business because uh, they don't want to scare away the tourists. Is that a proper analogy? I don't think so. I think there's risks in, in either direction of frightening people without due cause and also going the other direction. Um, you know, I think we, we mentioned the VE Day where we had did have big celebrations in the UK and now we can look a few weeks later and that doesn't seem to have caused any increase in infections or hospital, hospital admissions. So I think we have to be realistic. So there are things that the government can do very sensibly. So, for example, we know transmission is much um, harder uh, outdoors. Um, people are allowed into parks quite rightly. People can take drinks into parks. So it's about time in the UK we were looking at cafes and restaurants being able to open outdoors, as has happened in many other countries across Europe. We've got things like the uh, two metre social distancing rule we have in the UK, which is probably excessive. Um, the evidence of the additional risk from going to two metres, especially out of doors, seems to be lacking. But indoors, in the context of vastly reduced infections uh, that we have at the, at the moment, that would seem a sensible and pragmatic move to move down to one metre, which will help businesses be um, more viable. And will also, crucially, we haven't talked about schools, but the tragedy of the loss of education of children over the past few months has been really, really sad to see. And it's important that that changes as soon as possible.
Fabienne Peter, uh, it's true here, it's uh, uh, a meter and a half. Uh, the two meters, does it seem excessive? And, and that, that issue of schools is crucial if you want to get the, if you want to be able to uh, reopen the economy or at least free up uh, those that have been badly hit across social classes. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, but as Dergio says, um, if this puts everyone at risk, um, then we do probably have to bear the costs a little longer and make sure that the costs aren't just um, carried by those who are already not um, benefiting um, the most from the society. So balancing the effects, mitigating the effects, then becomes a challenge for the government. Pandemic. Uh, may I, been may bad? I just come in? Sorry. Go ahead. No, I just want to go back to, I think, the first question you asked, which was the asymmetry in, you know, what is a successful preventive policy? And there's been a recent study that has shown of how bad things would have been without lockdown. That may or may not be exactly correct. But by its very structure, the successful prevention policy will mean that we are going to see only one side of the balance. We are going to see the mental health problems. You said, you know, we're going to see the, the downside from not having schools, we're going to see the downside hit to the economy, which is huge, et cetera. But can you imagine if panic had allowed to be spread as the disease propagated out of control without lockdown, we would have seen many of those effects potentially far worse. Mental health, schools would have been closed and closed in panic. The disease burden would have killed even more people. Uh, the economy would have taken an even bigger hit. So it's not a trade-off. It's only a trade-off if you deliberately choose to ignore the benefits and the upsides from preventive measures that we've taken. So, and of course, you know, the longer the preventive measures go on, the more successful they are, the harder politically it is going to be to talk about uh, the, their necessity. And that's a political economy right, problem so, that every single country will have to deal with. So final question, I'll put it to Fabian Peter. You just heard Sunny Kapoor describe a horror movie that wasn't because we did have lockdown. Uh, yet going forward, his, his, when he states that uh, so far populists uh, have been hit bad politically, but down the, ride, down, down the road, when uh, the memory of the dying perhaps fades and the economic pain remains, will those populists make a roaring comeback? Well, we'll have to see, right, um, that I can't make a prediction about that. But it's clearly the case. It's not only that um, the governments with or the, the countries with populist governments are now sh shown to be fairly dysfunctional in how they respond to this crisis. It looks like even though people's trust in those governments were already weak, the poor results they are, are now showing or have to show for themselves has further weakened the trust in those governments. Um, and where that goes, we'll have to see. All right. Uh, before we go, uh, just a word, Stegos Moscos, really briefly, because we're out of time. What is the correct distancing then? The, the experiments that have been carried out have shown that uh, risk reduces by twofold for every meter that you stand away from an individual who may be carrying the virus. So the two meter rule is actually better than the meter rule and it halves your risk. Harder to apply though in schools and that could be the topic of another discussion. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I wanna thank you, Sturgis Moskos, for being with us uh, from Newcastle. I wanna thank uh, Fabian Peter in Warwick, David Payton in Nottingham and Sunny Kapoor in Oslo. Thank you for joining us in ever greater numbers on Facebook, Twitter, and on our YouTube channel. Bye for now. En Fras 24 nos esforzamos por brindar la mejor información hecha por periodistas de Latinoamérica y del resto del mundo. We look at how technology is shaping the future and we show you the latest gadgets you can soon get your hands on. نقدم لكم الاقتصاد بطريقة مختلفة نبسط المفاهيم والمصطلحات كي تكتمل الصورة لديكم. Aquí puedo hablar de medio ambiente, no solo de los problemas que afectan nuestro planeta, sino también de iniciativas y soluciones que a veces no tienen espacio en televisión. La différence sur France 24, c'est l'idée du reportage, nos grands reportages, vous ne les verrez nulle part ailleurs. Liberté, égalité, actualité.